Okay, hi everyone. I think we are going to just get started for now and then as people join, they'll just fall in. Um, okay, good morning everyone and um, welcome to the Power Up series. Um, I'm super, super excited to have everyone here for our first, but hopefully not last, meetup series geared towards Black Friday and Cyber Monday specifically. Um, our aim with the Power Up series is to help merchants around South Africa to just be ready and prepared for what has become the busiest season in e-commerce, um, not only in South Africa, but around the world. So if we can help you kind of feel a little bit more prepared for the next two months, um, then our job is done. Okay, so before we get into it, I just quickly want to go over some housekeeping rules. Um, so your mics will be muted throughout the talk, so you shouldn't be able to unmute your mics. Um, if you would like to keep your camera on or off, that is completely up to you. Um, so the speakers will all have their, their cameras on, but if you'd also like to keep your camera on, that's completely up to you. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to send messages, to introduce yourselves, to ask questions, and to really make use of the chat function. Um, so I will keep an eye on the chat function throughout the talk. Um, so if you have any questions, shoot them in there and I'll try and answer them or we will cover them in the Q&A session afterwards. Um, if you have any other issues, um, things aren't looking as they should or whatever, um, you can either send it just on the chat or you can even send it to me privately and I will try and assist you. Um, shortly after this, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, we will then go into the debate. So I will be leading the debate today and asking the questions. Um, we will do the whole debate and then we'll go into a Q&A session where we are going to try and answer the questions that you have as well. Um, so I know how, every, how busy everyone is, especially now. Uh, so we're going to try and keep this short and informative um, to less than an hour. Um, but if you have any questions that we can't answer or any questions that you then think of after the talk, you're welcome to send them to me. So I'll also send my email address to you all after, after this or when, before we close, and you'll be able to send your questions through to me as well. Okay, cool. Um, I think we can get into it. Uh, Eiffel, Anita. So our first talk of the series um, is a head-to-head. -head. So I would like to welcome my first two guests. So Ewald Fernandez from Tigers Global Logistics and my boss, Anita Erasmus of You Africa. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Dan, for having us. Morning, guys. Thanks for having us. <laughs> I am super, super excited for this. I think it's going to be something completely different. I know we've, we haven't done something like this before, even though we host a lot of Shopify meetups. So this is going to be a little bit different. Um, I think to start off, um, maybe you guys can each introduce yourselves, introduce your company, give us a little bit of background as to what you do. Um, yeah, I think Eobald, can we just start with you? Yeah, if it's okay with Anita, normally it's ladies first, but I'll go for it. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> My name is uh, Ewald Fernandez. I'm from a company called Tigers Global Logistics. So we are a global logistics and transportation company. Uh, we specialize in e-commerce logistics, uh, perishables, and then also transportation by air, sea, and road. Currently, we have uh, 70 offices globally and around 32 omni-channel uh, fulfillment warehouses where we do business to business and business to consumer, and also reverse logistics. And Tigers entered the South African market in 2013, so we're quite a new kid on the block, but we're embracing the challenges here in South Africa and we're enjoying the, the ride so far. Thank you. Right. 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 So now I need to try and also sound fancy after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I think a lot of people, I mean, I'm Anita, I'm the business manager for you, Africa. Um, from our side, is we also very much focus on the, the e-commerce um, customer in South Africa. A little bit different from where, where Eobalt is, is we kind of provide customers with the platform and the software in order to do the fulfillment process themselves, to streamline their process, um, and to be able to kind of allow them to do it as effectively as possible. In short, 
um, what I always tell people, we're kind of the glue between um, the e-commerce business and the career company. Um, and that is kind of where your Africa fits in, is to kind of bring those two entities together and to streamline that process of getting your parcel out from your warehouse to your customer um, and vice versa. So I think that is where we kind of specialize in. We work with about 1,700 online stores, you know, from the small ones to bigger ones. Um, we've been in the industries also since about 2012. We've morphed a typical tech company, doing quite a few things. Currently shipping is one of our main aims. Um, but we do, we're also doing a few other things as well. Um, but yeah, we love e-commerce. We love South Africa and very excited to be here. Um, so thank you for having me. Cool. Um, okay, so I think let's just get right into it. Um, Anita, you Africa is, allows you to do your, you know, your logistics in-house. It allows you to have that control and do it all yourself. Um, why do you believe so, so firmly in this? What, what, what inspires you to keep working for your Africa? So from maybe just to clarify for everybody here, it's always difficult with an audience. You don't know if it's people that are completely new, um, that's just looking to go into e-commerce or if it's people that's already been in the industry for quite a long time. Um, but just to, to clarify, when you say insourcing your, your fulfillment, it basically means that you, if you're an e-commerce merchant, you're managing the fulfillment side yourself which involves the storing, the picking, the packing, and the shipping of the parcel. So you basically have your own warehouse, you manage all of those processes, and you also need to ship that parcel to your customer. So that is what I would say in-house, in a sense, means. Um, and I think, as Danny has made it quite clear, that is the industry that we are operating in. So obviously, my knowledge about that is a lot more, and that's the way we assist customers. But from our side, is we've just really seen... Um, that it allows people to start small um, and then to be able to grow their business based on their needs. So I think what is really nice and one of the main benefits I would say with insourcing is that you can start yourself, you can know your business, and then as your business grows and you know your product is viable, then you can have the options at looking at maybe following the other route of outsourcing it. But that's what I would say one of the main you know, our claim to fame, maybe, or, or benefits with enforcing is that, um, you know, you can start yourself. A lot of the success stories with e-commerce merchants is I started out of my garage. I started out of my extra spare room. And that yeah. is the story. So I think that is what insource allows. It allows you to start like that. Cool. Thank you. Um, Evil, you are on the opposite side of the coin, so you, <laughs> yes, you work for a company that you know, really allows you to outsource your logistics. Um, why is this something that you believe in? Do you, can you just maybe go through what outsourcing is to you, um, what it allows your customers to do? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, to a certain extent, I have to agree with Anita. Um, most e-commerce customers start off small. But you do reach a point where it becomes too much. It's, it's all driven by the product, the volumes. Um, but I also understand that you want to keep it in house and control it. But at a certain point, the inventory control, the management, the fulfillment, you're going to reach a point where you need systems and system backup and support. And that's where a company like Tigers comes into the picture. We've got various turnkey solutions and plugins, the likes of Shopify, the Magentos, WooCommerce. Um, we prefer obviously using Shopify as one of our preferred plugins but we offer IT support to our customers. And because of the big, it's all about the data. If you look at Amazon, for example, everything is driven by data-driven decision-making, for instance. So we've got the data to support the decisions we make within the company. And it's all about having a scalable solution. And now some clients' products are maybe seasonal, for example. You don't need to rent an expensive warehouse where you sit with this um, asset that you have to pay, but your volumes are down, for example. We also do the staffing for you, we do the equipment, we've got specific scanners in place to manage the process for you. So at some point, yes, it's definitely, you have to look at a third party and see if you can outsource it with all those added benefits that come to the picture for you. Cool, okay, I think you've also covered, you know, the pros of, of outsourcing versus mm. keeping it in-house. Is there, are there any other pros to that or can we move over to Anita to maybe cover some of those pros from an in-house perspective? Yes, I, I can go. I think, I think if, if you talk about it, it's, it's sometimes difficult um, um, 
just talking about pros and cons um, mm. in a sense, but maybe it, let's say if I need to, somebody came to me and said, Anita, what is the main pros? Like if you, if you got a little bit more of a textbook answer, right? Mm. Uh, the PowerPoint, what, what is the benefits of doing the insourcing? As I've said, you can start yourself. I think that is really benefit. The other benefit is, is you can customize it um, and Evolve might disagree with me and tell me, you know, you can customize, we can also do everything you want to, but you are allowed to be a little bit more flexible, customize it, you know, just decide it's, it's um, Valentine's Day, I'm going to add something in there. So you're a little bit more flexible and be able to maybe customize it a little bit more, have a little bit more of a personal touch onto your product. And then um, something that we'll probably also get to is, is, is the cost side, but I think that is maybe we can discuss that a little bit more separately. Um, we need to compare the cost side of it. And I think something else that's really important where, where bigger merchants also need to consider that. And that's the whole thing of omnichannel, right? So omnichannel is a word that's been used quite often um, lately. And I think that's something we've seen especially now, you know, post COVID e-commerce is where some of the bigger merchants that wasn't present in the online space realized they have to go online. There isn't a choice anymore. I can't name names, but we've been working in the past few weeks with some customers that's already quite big physical presence in terms of retail, but they didn't really have an online, you know, presence. And they realized that, um, yes, it was maybe part of their 2020 2021 plan, but they had to kind of move that forward. So omni-channel in terms of that is um, when you've got stock, let's say, for example, in physical stores, and you've got stock now in your third party warehouse, where maybe you realize you need some of that stock in the physical store, it's quite expensive moving that stock from a third party warehouse than just moving it from your own warehouse where you're doing the fulfillment process. Because remember, with third party, there's a cost in the movement of the products. So I think that is something that's really important um, you know, to consider um, in terms of, of omni-channel is that the movement of the stock is, can also be costly. Where with insourcing, obviously there is a cost, but the cost is probably going to be a bit less moving that. Um, from out of the warehouse. So I would say that is, is, is one of the main, not looking that much at cost now, but some of the other benefits when it comes to, to mm -hmm. doing it yourself. And just one last thing is just learning the business, you know, learning how to do it yourself sometimes so that when you hand it over, you know it. Um, and you can't, in a sense, be bullshit, you know, bullshit by people because you know the process. Sorry for my language. You know the process. So I think that there's a lot of value in that as well. Um, so that's, yeah, that's my cup of tea. Evil, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just in terms of, so with a company like Tarkus, for example, so we do PO and vendor management for our customers. So if you want to differentiate between business to business and business to final consumer, we actually manage that process for our customers. We've got a very powerful tool called Smart Up Connect. It gives our customers visibility from origin all the way up to consigned destination. So ideally, you would not want to actually keep that in us. You would obviously want to give that to a third party like ourselves, where we can manage the whole process for you and give you that planning and visibility and KPIs. All the visibility is sitting in Smart App Connect. It enables you to do better planning with your, your end users and your final customers. One thing that we also need to consider with the way technology is moving forward, some states need buzzword will probably be P2P. We're talking about peer-to-peer -peer technology integration. And for a small in-house merchant that needs to expand, you'll need to have a third party that's investing in that technology on a global scale to be able to give you that technology moving forward. So it's quite important to also look at that aspect in terms of technology. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, well, maybe just um, something from, even just some of the terms that you're using, for me, that doesn't work that much within the third part where our industry can mm. be confusing for people, right? It's, it's like, yes. and I, I'm just thinking with us being in the industry, we know how it works so well. Um, it, it, it's a massive decision when you're on the e-commerce side. It's, it's probably one of the biggest decisions you're going to make, right? Um, I think off, if you know you've got a viable product, you know you've got something that's selling, should I, do, should I in, go in-house or should I outsource it? it, it yeah, it's, I think yeah. it's bigger than one could really. And it's a scary decision to make. I mean, you don't know what 
really is 100% going to be the right choice for you and your business. Um, and I think I wish, uh, hopefully with this talk, we can give people some form of which direction to go to. But I think yeah. one point that I want to make is that, and Evald, we had a little bit of a discussion before, and so I think we might agree mm. on this a little bit. Um, but just saying that it's very business specific. So it's very, yeah. very much based on, and that's why we, we won't be able to give you guys this totally an answer today of which is 100% correct for you because it depends on, and I think the two main things for me is your product, the type of product that you are selling. I mean, there's a big variety. And then your margin on your product, I think is, it's also really important. Um, so yeah, well, maybe you can, from your side, I think in-house insourcing from our side is, um, I think it allows for more or any kind of product because the person is doing it themselves. Is there something that you guys look specifically at or, or, or from a third party warehouse, do you guys say we will basically do it for any kind of product? So, um, and if I'm going to give you a generic answer to that question and go one step back, maybe the most important thing when you want to outsource and because we understand e-commerce in a different way, we've actually divided our warehouses into e-commerce logistics and then business to business. I think for, for somebody to move out from in-source to outsourcing, it's very important to speak to a partner that's flexible, that understands your business and is willing to actually listen to your side and your KPIs and your processes and to make it work. From coming from an in-house perspective, you know, you it's your baby, you, it's your hands-on, your bit of OCD, you control it. You need to get that level of trust before you can outsource. And I do believe that as a, there's a lot of uh, black, white and gray out there where performance warehouses are telling you how it should be done. Where it's maybe better, look, although we're a global company, we're actually quite small and medium-sized globally. We actually prefer working with small and medium-sized companies. We do have a, big, a few big clients in our warehouses, but for us, it's all about the client's needs. So when we set up these KPIs and value-added services with customers, we need to understand their values which is very important to us. And we found that we are quite flexible in terms of that. We're very scalable, which we allow to, to fit in with our customers as well. And then like I said to you, we're big on systems and big on data. Um, I think we're one of the few companies actually globally where we assist with integration or with e-commerce platforms. We actually don't charge for it. We've yeah. got various turnkey solutions. So what I'm trying to say is we actually make it easier, the decision for somebody to move from, from keeping it in us to moving to outsource. We make that transition quite easier because if you go to the market and say to a performance warehouse, I'm using Magento, or I'm using WooCommerce, or I'm using TradeGecko, all these other platforms, the guys normally back, get grab it into the back and say to you, well, let's get a developer in. Let's charge you for developing. And I think that scares people often going in the outsource because it becomes an expensive exercise. And I think the main reason for that is because three pairs are not flexible. They don't actually understand the e-commerce business like we do, for example. Yeah. I think, you know, that's interesting that you say that because from the from Africa side, we see there's a lot of value in that as well from our side because we've also kind of built the plug and play integration. Mm. We're really integrated into to Shopify and WooCommerce. Um, you, it's a really easy to integrate. There's no extra mm -hmm. fees in terms of the integration. It's really quick. So I think in the past, since May this year, we've seen quite a massive increase in obviously new customers. And I think a big, a big reason for that is um, it's not complex to start using us. You literally yeah. go in, you create a trial, you put in your details, you already have account with three career companies that yeah. you can start shipping with, you already have rates, and you can literally start shipping the next day. And I think that, that, that um, cause there's a cost of complexity involved, right? And I think because yeah. the cost of complexity from our side in terms of starting to, to, to use us and allowing customers to get their parcel from themselves to, um, you know, to their customer, um, has really benefited us as well. And, and I think we see a lot of value in that. And with e-commerce, you need to be quick, right? And we saw yeah. in the last four months, how the demand just increased. And um, I've also That's seen really to bad mouth career companies, we work very closely with a lot of them. Um, but trying to open up an account with a career company is not an easy process. Um, yeah. It's rates, it's trying to figure out how the rates look like. Um, and, and I thought I knew rate cards until I get a rate card from a new career and then I need to start all over again trying to understand it. 
So I think it's, there's a lot of value in making it as easy for an e-commerce merchant to, to start. Um, yes. Because it, in a sense, it's, people think it is easy, but there's a lot of different parts, right? You've got your website, you need to do the marketing side of it, you need to know how to package your product, you need to do the shipping side of it. So e-commerce is easier than it was, I would say, a few years ago, but it's still not easy. I think if it was easy, we all would probably not necessarily have been sitting here, but we would have had our online shop, you know, selling millions. We have to, right partners. We have to find the right partners, Anita. <laughs> we think cocktails on the beach. I, I do agree with you, Evald, but you also need to find the right product. Product yes. is so important. Um, and I think just people going nowadays saying they want to do the drop shipping, finding something unique, um, a very good brand that you can then kind of own and grow, I really still believe that is really the long-term success in terms of offer mm -hmm. costs. So one of the value propositions that we try and make case studies on and try and sell as a, as a 3PL is that entrepreneurial people are in it for the people skills, the marketing and the sales. Wasting time, well, we feel it's wasting time on picking and packing and ordering boxes, doing inventory control, managing staff, um, renting equipment, renting warehouses, paying 60, 70,000 rand for fancy um, scanners, paying developers to do integration for you, rather than focus on what you love and your passion is your e-commerce product that you want to sell online. Focus on your Google ad analytics, focus on your returns, focus on your marketing, focus on the things that you're passionate about. And that's what we're all about. When, when it becomes too much for you in us, give the product to us, we'll handle it for you, treat it exactly the same state that you were doing it, but focus on your sales and marketing. That's why you're an entrepreneur. You want to be online and selling stuff. Yeah, well, maybe, I mean, I, 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 I'm probably my argument is on the other side of the coin, but I do agree with you. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's difficult to say or not to justify that the complexity of doing it yourself is a lot more. Um, managing people, um, insurance, and I think theft in South Africa, we've worked with merchants where, you know, that's also a big part. You need to make sure that you don't have staff stealing more stuff than what you're selling. Um, and I think maybe from my side, I would say is that we, if I was an e-commerce merchant, know your strengths. You get yeah. some people that are really good at putting process assistance in place, working with people as part of, as part of their strength as an entrepreneur, you're very good at that. If that is something that's part of your skill set, yes, in sourcing, you might be really good at it. You might be, you know, stand out. It can be a competitive um, advantage for you. But if you, if that is not your strength and you are a lot more, you know, focused on just doing the other side of the business, um, than rather doing that. So, which brings me back to the fact, know yourself and each business is different. Yeah. Um, and that's why there isn't, I would say, you know, a specific route that is a must or you shouldn't type of thing. Another benefit, and we don't really raise this point, is a lot of, a lot of clients, their hearts are still in South Africa and a lot of people are actually um, immigrating overseas. And uh, but what we bring to the party for them is they still have their businesses in South Africa which they manage online. We know that e-commerce business is a universal global business you can run online. And if you outsource it to a fulfillment partner that can take care of it in the same way you've been doing it, you can still immigrate and still manage your business remotely. I know it's not a big talking point, but it's a reality. Two or three of our customers are actually sitting overseas, but their businesses are still in South Africa being run by us and managed by us. Yes. So it's just, but like you said earlier, and I'm not gonna beat it to death this, this topic, on the product and the volume, but it is product dependent. A lot of customers are happy to keep it in house with a certain volume, but when you start reaching your, in, you must do an internal investigation and look at your, your costing, uh, get a percentage of what fulfillment is costing you on your product, then look at your margins and then decide, is it still worth your while? Is it eating away your margins? Can you do the fulfillment in house? And then when you reach that happy medium and you want to expand, then is when you'll start looking at outsourcing. But keeping it in house up to a certain point is always, a valid point to look at. Yeah. Okay, so we do agree on something. Yes, definitely. <laughs> well, that was going to be my next point of discussion is um, just you both touched on it um, quite a bit. Um, this looking at the type of products that you're selling and also looking at your margins. Um, and this also kind of goes into, into the costing of it. So which is more 
cost beneficial for certain companies. I know a lot of people um, always ask or they tend to ask, this is my product, should I be outsourcing or should I do this, this in-house? Um, what do people need to look at? Um, so you did say type of product. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that? And maybe Anita, you can, you can give us a go. I think from a casting side, it is, it's, a, it's a very daunting calculation to go and make and probably extremely time consuming. And that's why a lot of merchants hasn't done it. But I think there's a lot of value in it. So from insourcing, if you need to go and calculate what, and I think Evald said that, what is the average cost it, it costs you to fulfill a product? So that basically means, as I've said, storing, picking, packing, and shipping. So storing would be, what is your rent that you're paying? Um, what are you paying the people um, to, to pick and pack them? So that's your, 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 your employee cost. Um, what is your, um, the cost of your packaging? What is your insurance for your warehouse costing you? Your electricity, your water, um, all of that. So that is probably a calculation that you'll have to make. It sounds very daunting, but yes, I don't I mean you probably have all of those figures. And then also going looking at your shipping cost. What is your average cost that costs you to ship a parcel, um, you know, from yourself, the, the actual cost you're paying your career company, and obviously your software cost as well, what you're paying your software providers. Go and take the total cost of that. And then you actually go and divide it by the amount of products you are selling um, or fulfilling over a month period. And that will, in a sense, give you your average. If you've got that brand value, then you can go to somebody like um, Earvault and them or a third party warehouse. And then when they give you a costing, you can compare the two. And I think that is really important. It doesn't help that you go, if you're doing it in-house yourself, to go to a third party warehouse if you haven't got that cost calculation already. Because you need to, in a sense, try to compare apples to apples. So I would say before you go and confuse yourself, Try and calculate what it is costing you now. Um, it might be, remember, as you grow, that um, cost per package should also decrease because you can find volumes, you've, you know, using more space in your warehouse. So also maybe forecast where you're going to be calculated based on that. And then when you've got that knowledge, you go to a third party warehouse and you say, okay, guys, you know, and then you can actually go and compare it. So I think that is, that is very important. One thing just to mention, and it's maybe not winning any points for my side of the debate, but um, the cost of complexity should also be considered um, mm -hmm. when you're doing it yourself, managing the people. What is this costing you as a business owner? Um, and all of that. So I think you can't always put a rand value on that, um, but you can maybe add some, something to the costing, um, what it will cost you as a business owner compared to what it will, will not cost you if you maybe outsource it. Um, so that, yeah, that's my side of when it comes to costing. I don't know, Evald, if you want to add. Yeah, the, the costing side is always a, it's a big problem on, 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 I think, everybody's side to try and, you're trying to always achieve that economies of scale. But the truth of the matter is, if you go and work out that cost, you'll actually be in for quite a surprise. It? Labor and equipment and WMA systems, which is warehouse management systems, technology and stuff, costs money. Mm -hmm. So we have noted with that, quoted clients before where we actually asked you what is your percentage um, that you're willing to spend on fulfillment and what is your average value of a product and when we do the warehouse analysis for them and we do the proposal we also add a little quote template they can actually do some calculations and volumes for themselves and at the bottom it will normally give you the percentage what the fulfillment is costing you per item and then normally at some stage and that's what we also do as an outsource company we don't necessarily just want to take on the business and it's going to be at a, at a deficit for yourself as, an, as a business owner. We actually do that calculation to show you that actually your product is not really at this stage or viable to be given to a fulfillment partner. Um, your margins are too low, the product value is too low. We've got a little list that we normally share with clients and say to them, these are the type of products that we normally see sales well online because they can absorb the fulfillment costs. And at the end of the day, it is a cost factor that needs to be accounted for. And not all products are viable. Um, you're talking about an average of 20 to 24 rand per item to do fulfillment, excluding courier. You're really sitting on maybe 100 rand to fulfill and ship a parcel within the borders of Johannesburg, for example. So it adds. If your product, you only sell your product for 150, 160 rand, your margins are being eaten away by fulfillment and courier costs. Yes. So it's a very important exercise. So what we try to do is we've got a, an average cost per pick 
for two types of fulfillments in our warehouses, and then obviously storage and documentation fees and minimums like that. And based on that, we do a markup on that for our customers to give them an idea of what fulfillment's going to cost them. But it's a very simple exercise you can do in house. Take all your costs, like you said, Anita, take your number of orders and your number of picks, divide it into your cost and get an average pick. And if you're not able to beat three rand per pick in the performance yourself, you're not going to be able to outsource it. I can tell you that now as an, as an end. Yeah. Okay, well, I actually have a really quick cool question from, from a, a participant um, that actually kind of falls right into this. So I'm just going to ask it now. Um, what would be the minimum scale a company should be at to consider outsourcing logistics? <laughs> well, I think that's for you. Yeah, we actually touched that. We had a very really bit of a comedic answer earlier when we said when you actually wake up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror and you're tired. Um, when you are, as a business owner, busy picking and packing and you're very involved, it's like uh, Anita said earlier, the complexity, you can't really put a price to it. And if I sometimes get involved with the warehouse, I always make a joke and say I'm the most expensive picker in South Africa. Um, but I'd rather be looking for business or creating better processes or looking after my staff. You know, you need to look at yourself in the pros and say, am I adding the correct value to my business? Um, is this, am I reaching the economies of scale within my business? Is this starting to cost me money? Um, it's an internal exercise you can do yourself. And like I go back a few steps again and I said, are you in it to manage the business and operationally be involved or do you want to focus on the sales and the marketing? When you are losing um, sight of your future and where you want to be and you're too involved with the operational side, it will be a good time to do the in-house exercise, like Anita said earlier, and then see what it's costing you, and then start getting some pricing and do some comparisons. Cool. Anita, do you want to add something to that? No, I agree, agree completely with Evald. I think that is um, very much the way to go. It's not as if we can say, when you start selling 1,000 products per month, um, you know, then you need, there's no specific fine line. So maybe looking at yourself in the mirror <laughs> is uh, <laughs> looking, looking at yourself in the mirror and your business um, in yes. detail. Um, and then yeah. really just go with your gut. I think for me so, as, as a business manager, sometimes you need to make big decisions and sometimes think, is it the right decision? And I go, I actually don't know because there is no right answer. You just need yeah. to go with your gut. And I think going with your gut it, there's a lot more value in that really than what, what, what we as, I would say as, as business owners or entrepreneurs or whatever think is, um, yeah, there's a lot of value in that. So if you, if you start I think, thinking about it quite a lot, um, do the exercise, um, why not? Yeah, just to add to that, Anita, be very careful to throw more um, solutions to the problem. Don't employ more people in your busy seasons and then all of a sudden you're quiet again because your product is seasonal, for example. Work with the base you've got, do the exercise, and if you're having to throw more resource towards that to um, make the process better, then there's already a warning sign and you'll see it because if your economy, if you look at your costings and your percentage, the more resource you're throwing at the problem, the more the percentage will increase. And that's where you realize, like, hold on a second, this is not working. Yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, Okay. okay, cool. I think before we go into a Q&A with the participants, um, I think we can just do a very general question to the two of you. Um, what, what other advice can you give to merchants? So if the merchants starting out um, or merchants that are reconsidering the way they do the logistics, so maybe we can just start with Anita on this one. What other advice can you give? Um, I think because we are very much in um, Black Friday, Cyber Monday times, and I think the Power Up series is a little bit about that. I do think the talk that we have today is maybe something you should have decided already in terms of this year's Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So my advice would be is that we are already end of October in terms of that. Maybe don't try and make too much changes now. Um, but do you start thinking about what you want to do next year? Um, so I think that is important. Um, you know, I don't want this talk to now somebody go and decide now we want to move over, you know, two weeks before the busiest time of the year. So timing, I think, is also really important, planning ahead. And I think for, for this year, um, 
we all don't really know how it's going to look like. Um, I do think November is going to be a very busy month. And I do think Black Friday will also be kind of be over more the whole November, not just the, you know, the last, um, the last weekend of November. Um, and then just from, from an e-commerce side, I would say is, um, and I, I, people are gonna hate me saying this, but analyzing your figures. And, and I've just seen working with a lot of smaller merchants, people are intimidated by Excel spreadsheets. They're intimidated sometimes by numbers. They're creative brains, they love products, they love marketing, yeah. they love all of that. But when it comes to numbers, they're scared. So they end up maybe not doing something about it. Analyze your shipping cost, analyze what your average income. If you are running, there's a lot of, and that's great about e-commerce, there's a lot of stats you can work with and you can make educated decisions. But mm -hmm. that means you're going to, as a business owner, spend time on that on a monthly basis go through the costings, check what people are charging you. So make an effort to look at numbers and make decisions based on that. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that, but as business owners, sometimes you don't have time to do that and that end up, you're going to do it next month, I'm going to do it the following month. But I would say this about, take one day in a month where you say, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm literally just looking at numbers and I'm making decisions based on that. So I think there's a lot of value in that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think you put on the nail there, Anita. So we, we're trying to embrace a new buzzword. It's actually not a new buzzword, but it's all about uh, data-driven decision-making, uh, like you said. So, you know, if you, and that's why we're big on data and we're big on sharing data with our clients. Um, you might have heard the center of gravity exercise with courier companies where they take all your data and your zip codes and they plan your routes for you. It's the same with us, and I'm, I'm sure your, your merchants online can also have record of all their picks and sales or the activity over a period of time. Analyze that, total it up, uh, do some investigation, see where you can improve. Remember, at the end of the day, it's all about the customer experience. Anything you as a merchant can improve to improve the experience of your customers, whether it's having better stock visibility, a better presence online. It's also very important to manage your inventory control. So in terms of a logistics, if I can give some advice, is have very strict measures in terms of your inventory control. That's really important. Make sure your systems are in place and make sure you manage your costs. And, and the most important thing, and I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier, look at that margin. If anything in the business is not working, you're seeding your margins. If you are taking money out of the bed in cash to go and get a temp guy to come and do some packing for you, so record this. All about data and recording your data and just look at the data, look at the numbers. Even if you're not a numbers person, like Anita said, punch it into an Excel spreadsheet and just, just see, what did I do in October 2017? What was the buzz with them? What, what was in the market? What was happening there? What was my downfalls? Look at your history and see where you failed the system and the process in the past and see how you can improve on that. Because at the end of the day, you only get one chance with an e-commerce customer. And I've heard this numerous times. And we as a fulfillment partner swear by it, we can't afford making mistakes. And um, returns because of incorrect picks. Make sure those processes are in place. Make sure your barcoding is in place. A very big transition from going in-house to, uh, to outsourcing is having barcodes because we as a logistics company work with scanners and that's to try to avoid the human intervention. The less human intervention, the more everything is um, process driven, the less areas, the better the system works. I mean, it filters straight through when you're inbound to when you're ordering and picking through to UAfrica. UAfrica is only as good as the data they receive from Shopify. Shopify is only as good as the data they receive from the customers. The data needs to be driven from you. So your, your website and your control processes need to guide people in the right direction that works according to your system. Yeah. Now that's very true. And I think one tip that I can also give um, to um, a lot of merchants um, in South Africa, especially, is that make sure that on checkout, you ask your customers specifically for a suburb view. You'll see a lot of the checkout addresses, like address field one, address field two, postal code, and you know city. But the courier companies make use of a suburb and a postal code. So if you don't have, um, you know, that suburb requested on your, your address, then as Evolta said, the quality of the address that you're getting from your customer is already not great. Now that gets passed onto your fulfillment provider. That thing gets passed onto the courier company. And then that parcel, you know, 
the chances of them being a first time delivery um, is a lot smaller. So even just create like, if there's the field, don't have it address field one and address field two, it should be address field one, suburb, postal code and city. And then already just with that, you're a lot more covered um, having the suburb because that is what most of the queries in South Africa use to deliver a parcel, the postal code and the suburb. Okay, cool. so that's from my side, yeah. Awesome. So I think let's leave it at that and let's move into the Q&A. So we have some really cool questions that have come through. Um, so some of them are directed at a specific person, but others are not. So I'm just going to start off with a question for Eobald. Um, Do you pay for stock if it doesn't move? Um, so in other words, do you pay for shelf time? Yeah, so traditionally, so we come from a traditional type of warehouse setup. So for us, we don't generate revenue for stock sitting on our shelves. So we generate revenue with activity. So you'll find that people always give you a very cheap storage rate. Um, and then your handling and your picking and packing charges are slightly increased to try and create activity. But obviously, yeah, dwell time is a problem. Uh, we as a fulfillment warehouse cannot generate um, any revenue if stock is sitting on the shelves. And yeah, so we normally work on a up to a four week certain rate and then a plus six week we start charging more because we're encouraging customers to rather move the stock out, put new stock in, or maybe um, try and add a special online. We also do analytics in terms of slow movers. We actually give our customers reports monthly, say to them, look, the stock has been sitting or it's batch driven or serialized driven, move it, do a special online, try and sell it and try and move it because dwell times is a problem for us. We don't like stock sitting and rather encourage clients to move it out, which is not a bad thing necessarily. If, if your 3PL is managing that for you, in a sense, they're doing you a favor by telling you, listen, the stock is sitting, we're gonna charge you more, do something about it. Move it out, sell it on a special, move it, maybe change your range, maybe it's time, maybe it's a sign, change the range, this is not working. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, this one is for Anita. Um, hello, Anita, I find that your Africa is cheaper in getting quotes from third party career companies in more urban or modern parts of the country, but extremely poor when it comes to remote areas. How can we fix that? Oh, very good question. Um, difficult one to answer. I think just to mention that we are a tech company as well. We build the software and then, you know, we, we're not a career ourselves. So it's not as if we've got that much control over the rates that is being given to us. So it is a constant back and forth between careers to try and get the best rates, you know, possible. We have seen that the South African careers all, um, are very competitive um, in terms of quotes for um, urban areas and main centers. But when it comes to regional areas, they are still very expensive. And it's because of their costing model as well. It's all about volumes and their density. If they've got a lot of parcels in a small area, it's cheaper for them to deliver. Where if they've got only 10 parcels going to Springbok, the driver still needs to drive there and still needs to drive back. Um, and then those you know, regional deliveries are, are more expensive. We have seen careers, I think, as the competition has increased, being a little bit more competitive on that side. Um, but yes, I do agree that regional deliveries in South Africa are probably still more expensive than what one would like them to be if you look at e-commerce from a global perspective and what you pay for South Africa regional deliveries. Um, what I can always say is that the rates that we've got, it's never impossible for a courier, another courier to come in with better rates. So we are actually at the moment speaking with quite a few career companies um, and hoping to get better rates from them as well. Um, it might not be this year already, but then definitely early next year. But what I can also advise, if you're a customer from New Africa and you've gone to a career company and they've given you amazing regional rates, speak to us about it. Send us the rates, tell us, listen, I went to this career, they're able to give me great regional rates. We can have discussions with them and we can see if they're a really good career company to add them on as well. So it's, you know, not, our intention to give that good rate through always like to so it would be great if, if merchants can keep us um, informed um, and tell us if you find a great company um, that is offer or willing to offer really good regional rates um, that we can look into them. Okay, cool. Thank you, Anita. Um, we have another question for Eervald. Um, do you handle returns and how does it impact costs? Um, we do we do annual reverse logistics. We do reverse logistics in our warehouses for most of our customers. 
And we try and keep the cost low as possible because it does impact the margins of the customer. But like in anything, there's a handling fee involved if it's physical labor to actually check it in. And then it becomes quite a not, a, not a tedious process, but we request from customers to give us a return policy. And in the return policy, they list the minimum and maximum requirements for us to put something back into stock or to move it into quarantine. Remember, there's a cost factor involved for us to manage returns because if it goes into quarantine, it's storage. So we have to cater for that. It's an additional process that's added onto the flow of the wells that actually has an impact on the general flow because now we're taking people that you're picking and packing off to go and do quality control, check it. Then you have to go back to the customer and say, there's a gray area on your quality policy to return this. It's got a scratch on the left hand side, not the right hand side. You will return it or not. So it becomes a communication thing. So it actually, it, it, it's a process that we do. We do handle it, but it's not ideal, but we do handle it for customers, not a problem. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Um, and then we have, I think let's make this the final question. Um, do you use what three words as an address for deliveries? So I don't know if you're aware of what three words. I know you Africa doesn't use it. Um, yeah, but I don't know, does Tigers Global Logistics use that? No. No, we mainly focus on fulfillment, not actually the courier side. We use the likes of your Africa and our sister companies. I don't no, know cool. if you maybe knows that. I think with, with what three words is um, we had discussions with them, but that was maybe two years ago. Um, and I'm not, I mean, I, I think if I'm going to comment, I, I might not comment the right information, but it's, I think it's also important to note that the customer will have to give that a checkout. I do think what three words has got integrations with WooCommerce and Shopify checkout, but I'm not sure. Um, but I would say at the moment, it's probably not something we're looking at in, in the short term. Okay, cool. Thank you for, the, for those answers. Um, everyone, I hope your questions have been answered. If not, um, you're welcome to send through your questions to marketing at youafrica.com. Um, so I know sometimes you go to bed in the evening and you have a question that you think you should have asked but you forgot or didn't think of at the time. So if at any point you think back on this talk and you have a question that you'd like answered, just send it through to marketing at youafrica.com and I will try my best to get the right information to you. Um, okay, thank you, Anita. Thank you, Eobald, for your time today. Thank you. And so much information. Um, okay. It was super, super, super informative. So I really hope that everyone has gotten the information that yeah. they were looking for. Great, thank you and for I, having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all the listeners for joining us. Um, it wouldn't have been made possible without you guys, so we appreciate making the time for us. Thank you. Cool. Great. Right. Thank you guys. Enjoy your Tuesday. Perfect. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.